and we can start. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Kren uh, from Macedonia. I'm a student uh, in Istanbul at Ibn Hala University, where I study um, uh, a double major program of history and, uh, and political science and international relations, and also study a Bachelor of uh, Law uh, at uh, Pantheon Paris 1 Sorbonne University. Um, well, um, this um, basically um, intercontinental education gave me the opportunity to travel and learn many foreign languages. And this is something which I'm very proud of because when you learn a language, basically you are understanding the culture and the life of other people around the globe. All right, so today I would like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Sami for hosting this session. And uh, also I would like to uh, thank uh, the team of the Social Sciences Lab and Mr. Zubair Kwaya from Fatima Firiob University for inviting me for uh, making this uh, lecture or talk today. So I will be basically um, talking about uh, actually migrants between the resurgence of labor inequalities and the emergence of COVID-19. Well, I would like uh, before starting to say that it's a privilege and honor to be here with all of you. And so um, a migrant, um, I mean, migration as a topic is a very common topic. It is maybe the most pronounced word on the planet. Therefore, I thought once writing a paper about um, actually migrants, COVID-19 and labor inequalities and how they are interrelated. So uh, let me start. Basically, uh, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic restructured the social order of the world. Um, basically, we are going to analyze the zoonotic origin of COVID-19 and the negative impact of the resurgence of labor inequalities for migrants and workers. Scientists always should search for the source of the virus, so they should always a search for the source of the virus. Why I reiterate this sentence twice? Because if we know where is the source of the virus, we can basically detect um, the process of transmission and how fast it is, etc., etc. Thus, there is the new approach of One Health that reflects the fundamental link or interdependence between human, animal, and environmental health. The dark world scenario was characterized with the introduction of online work and education, or in another word, or in another words, digital life. Well, overnight people, we know that lost their jobs, schools closed, children and university students started to study online, and hospitals were saturated suddenly. Well, we noticed that there was a dire need to change the scope of this unexpected event. And still there is a dire need to change the scope of this unexpected event, which we all know, and that is the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, some countries are adopting adequate policies to curb the rapid mutation of the virus. However, we notice that there is slight inefficiency. Why I say this? because the inefficiency of some policies paralyze the proper functioning of the entire world. Basically, the entire world now, it's in a lockdown. There is a scarcity of vaccines and uh, people are still obliged to follow, to some extent, a digital mode of life. There is uh, the importance of reducing social inequalities, providing decent work and economic growth for each country. And this will be possible by eradicating the phenomenon of slow justice and ameliorating the, perf the performance of the main international and internal institutions. And this is actually a post COVID-19 mission. It's not a mission during COVID-19. It is a post COVID-19 mission. Um, we know that the industrial revolution of the 18th century gave birth to the notion of labor rights. Shortly after, international humanitarian law was added as a separate branch of legal philosophy. Hence, the primacy or imprescriptibility of peculiar international principles 
such as the notion of gender parity, the prohibition of labor inequalities, the prohibition of child labor, or the, the prohibition of child exploitation, the principle of non refoulement or the principle of collective, of the prohibition of collective expulsion, uh, was actually all of these principles were extensively promoted. So where it all started, Antonio Gutierrez, in December 2020, stated despite their legal status. And he said, just as migrants are integral to our society, they should remain central to our recovery. I absolutely love this sentence because um, we know that the status, the legal status of migrants is always put into question because there are always some irregularities between the slow type of justice who is providing papers for these migrants and uh, the period that the migrants are waiting to get valid papers in order to be able to work and reside in the country where they decided to leave so. Well, the COVID-19 outbreak, basically, we know that this a pandemic that suddenly started to emerge in Wuhan, China. The virus appeared suddenly, unexpectedly, but the mutation process was silent. And nowadays we have the British mutation, the Brazilian mutation, the South African mutation, etc., etc. This reflects the zoonotic origin of COVID-19. And what is the zoonotic origin of COVID-19? That means that we all heard about the, the the first theory that bats transmitted the virus to human beings. So when a virus is transmitted from animals to humans, we call this zoonotic origin or zoonotic transmission of a virus. Therefore, we qualify COVID-19 to be an unprecedented zoonotic disease or zoonoses that are actually infectious diseases. The infectious agent is the host who attacks the vulnerable immune system of the animals. However, when the humans are in contact with these animals, they get infected as well. The trajectory of the whole process of virus transmission is inevitable, if it is not previously detected, of course. Migrations are the core pillar of international law. Mig migrations are actually like mutations. They can occur unexpectedly. Nevertheless, history is a perpetual commencement. Viruses and migrations are repetitive. Nothing can stop them. Even the most repressive legal policies cannot make a difference. Throughout history, migrations are perceived as a negative phenomenon. However, in the modern times, if there is a brain drain in a peculiar country, then foreigners are welcome. In this case, migration is a very positive feature indispensable for the development of that peculiar country. Well, what are the main lessons and responses for COVID-19? Um, they are very simple uh, to understand. The promotion of the approach of One Health is indispensable. We cannot talk always about the importance of human health only. We need to include animal and environmental health as well. We cannot divide the rules, or the rules of nature nor categorize them. Well, let's go back a little bit further in history. We know that the Spanish flu of 1918 was a dramatic health event. Uh, Jeffrey uh, K. Uh, Tobin Berger qualifies the Spanish flu of 1918 as the mother of all pandemics. It's considered to be the mother of all pandemics. Then can we call COVID-19 to be the mother of all zoonotic disease? It's an eventual theory. It is debatable, of course. It is important to mention that the coronavirus is a novel virus. That means it's a new type of virus that was never seen before. In Latin language, the word novel means new. Um, I would like to mention that COVID-19 is identified under the code SARS-CoV-2 and the Spanish flu was 
recorded as influenza A, a subtype H1N1. Both viruses are influenza viruses because the primary issue is always the mode of transmission. However, um, we know what are the symptoms of um, basically of the emergence of COVID-19, what, what are the symptoms that are provoked. Um, and basically, um, I can now talk more about migration, which is the core notion of this talk. I can basically say that with the emergence of COVID-19 started actually the resurgence of labor inequalities. This worsened the situation. There was a high rate of unemployment before the COVID pandemic, before the COVID-19 pandemic as well, but the high rate of unemployment during the COVID-19 pandemic is unprecedented in modern history. Well, I will talk now about migration theories. How we perceive the world of migration and labor inequalities. Well, the philosophy of human territorial movement is basically called the philosophy of migration. The scholar Saskia Sassen stated that migration is an urban future. So it's an urban future. Over time, people moved from the villages to the cities because there were better life opportunities, of course. There were schools for children, university for students, factories for the people seeking new job opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. The 1960s and the 1970s are considered to be the golden ages of migration. Migration in these ages was peculiar. Actually, this migration was selective. That means that people were recruited by other countries to come to work and live there for, for a longer period of time. For instance, in the Netherlands and Germany, in the 1960s and the 1970s, there was a scarcity of workers or there was no enough uh, numbers of workers um, residing in Germany to be able to work on the um, fields. Therefore, um, in 1960s, plenty of Turkish people went to work on the fertile lands in the Netherlands and Germany. This type of migration was known also as labor recruitment. For instance, nowadays in Germany live more than 3 million Turkish people, descendants of the uh, migrants, um, worker migrants that went to work there. Um, basically, I would like to mention also that according to Pichet, Migration must occur sooner or later because it is not sta static. He's saying that after a certain time, via process of circular and cumulative causation, migration becomes self-perpetuating and that's a problem. Self-perpetuating means that uh, migration is sometimes uncontrollable. Um, and Pichet also is mentioning that Stakeholders are not always employers, but also they can be traffickers. And human trafficking is forbidden by law. This was also um, um, as an idea basically um, portrayed by the scholar Chrisman. Human trafficking or trafficking person is divided into three categories. The first category defines the act. The second category uh, basically um, the means and the third, the purpose. What is very in interesting is that many theories propose, propose different types of reasons and solutions and that makes legal scholarship to be very diverse and rich with information. For Godula Cossack and Stephen Castles, migrations occur frequently because of the presence of Western capitalism. Subsequently, transnationalism as a phenomenon represents the positive structure of recurrent migrations. This is an idea that was also promoted by many other international organizations. The scholar Victor Pichet argued that there is an interaction between immigration and development. This basically immigration occurs because in some regions there are better life conditions. He points out actually that there is a micro individual and macro structural approaches of migration. So we see that migration can be categorized in various ways and that makes legal and historical scholarship very complicated. But 
that is the process that's the painful writing process of many scholars making new theories that will let you think more deeply about the multiple flows of migration which is actually one of the categories of the macrostructural approach well according to akin mag uh, Mabogunje, staying in contact with the family members living in the country of origin reflects the phenomenon of social cohesion. Therefore, Mabogunje defines this type of migration as a circular migration, which was a notion originally coined by Burawai. However, Burawai, as a scholar, stated that migration is not always caused by the lack of economic prosperity. And the COVID-19 pandemic is the perfect proof for that. Migration during the COVID-19 was basically stopped to some extent because countries closed their borders. However, in many countries of Latin America, still migration occurred and uh, people are moving for different reasons, such as medical reasons. For instance, in some, if in some countries there is a scarcity of vaccines or medicines, well, people migrate to other countries to get vaccines and to get medicines. So migration, we see that is not always caused by the lack of economic prosperity. Sometimes health can be one of the reasons for migration. Sometimes also the structural and political features are, are playing a huge role as well. Well, Pichet explained that the central notion of his theory is based on the principle of geographical separation of the processes of labor force renewal or reproduction from those of maintenance. As a definition, this seems very complicated, but um, ge geographical separation as a notion can include many speculations about the reasons of migration. Um, Burawai also mentions that there is a notion of twin dependency that literally includes the social ensemble of economic, political, and legal aspects necessary for the proper development of the labor market. So, well, according to him, in every time, in every type of society, there was some form of dependency. In the pre-industrial era, the mode of societal survival was the tribal organization. And this tribal organization was the equivalent of the notion of modern dependency. Well, in the tribal societies, the, the political institution was the leader, while the representatives of the economic one were the slaves or the members of the tribes. The leader had a status and a membership. In modern times, this was equivalent to the notion of citizenship while the slaves had to work on the land because that was the only way that they could receive food and protection. So the, the form of dependency was very crucial in the pre-industrial era because people and lords as well were not having any other option. And this was the survival mode of migration. So in the industrial societies, mainly in capitalism, the economic branch is led by is led actually by seasonal workers who are employed by the labor givers. And in this case, the labor givers are the factories who are considered to be social institutions. So it's a very sociological way of um, a legal philosophy as well. During the industrial era in England, the institutions were the owners of the mines, while the working class constituted of many children, young boys and young girls. Child labor was permitted in that period. However, in the, in the aftermath of the industrial, in the industrial revolution, there was an important step undertaken and that was the notion of human rights and the prohibition of child labor that was legally finally established. Well, what were the labor inequalities during the era of COVID-19? We can say that the labor inequalities that emerged during the era of COVID-19 were considered as few crises into one crisis. Into one uh, crisis. Uh, so Vincent Chatile, which is a scholar, as a scholar, he defined the COVID-19 pandemic uh, as a crisis within the crisis. So therefore, like there are numerous crises that create house in society. As a matter of fact, 
COVID-19, we said that it is an unprecedented crisis. In other words, it is crucial to highlight that few crises occurred during the same crisis. There was a health crisis, economic crisis, educational and political crisis. Basically, suddenly everything stopped. We had to find adequate solutions in order to be able to continue the work of, of, of politicians, scholars, professors, doctors, etc., etc. Maybe, and actually it is true, it is certain, it's not maybe that during the COVID-19 pandemic, the doctors were the one who worked the most to save the life of many people. People also we know that started to work from home because they were started to be confined. So work activities were conducted completely at home during total lockdowns. However, during partial lockdowns, people were working two days in the office, three days at home in average. Anil Duman um, states that in order to measure the possibility of work during the lockdown, we first divide the economic activities into three categories, essential, closed, non-essential, and not closed. In other words, teleworkable. So basically, I am giving this a talk in a teleworkable way. Uh, we are trying to um, give or explain some concepts and notion via, uh, um, via internet by using the uh, help of the modern technology. So the work during the COVID-19 pandemic became teleworkable. So, well, in order to distinguish the essential and closed economic activities, we use the official decrees beginning on the 11th of March, which correspond to the date of coronavirus being declared as a pandemic by World Health Organization. Or, um, uh, I mean, this is the point that he's stating, Anil Duman, the scholar that wrote this sentence, I'm just quoting him. In the Turkish case, there were 62% non-essential economic activities, 31% essential jobs, six non-essential or closed job sectors. This is the information that I got from the article of Anil Duman. Um, I can say that during the, no, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the notion of women's rights was needed to be extensively promoted because during COVID-19, there was an increased number of femicides and divorces and we can say that the fate of the women's rights during COVID-19 pandemic is considered to be a frequent discrimination and this is due to the societal segregation that is actually and substantially causing problems and divergence of opinions in the society. The category men, women and women perceived as caretakers or homemakers and men acknowledged as breadwinners is the primary societal and discriminatory segregation. It is a very and huge problem in the society. In 1791, in the aftermath of the French Revolution, the feminism movement initiated by Olympe de Gouges promoted the rights of women. Olympe de Gouges, it is the prominent uh, uh, woman of letters, and she's the author of the female French Declaration of Human Rights entitled as Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen. We speak now about COVID-19 and we compare the situation of feminism two centuries ago. Olympe de Gouges firmly launched a universal call for raising awareness about the rights of women. And she asks men, Man, are you capable of being just? It is a woman who poses you the question. You will not deprive her of that right at least. Well, this sentence, man, are you capable of being just? Are you capable of giving the woman a voice? Well, this um, actually can be compared to the negative um, emergence of or high rate of femicides during the COVID-19 pandemic because couples are staying at home and women lose their lives, unfortunately. Well, in this case, um, 
men, are you capable of being just? It's a sentence that um, makes you think and makes you feel perplexed because women to some extent in, so in some societies, unfortunately still feel the, the negative consequences of the societal segregation. And it is different when you are able to at least speak out and share your story with the world. Therefore, are you capable of being just? It's a, it's a sentence that will struck everyone who uh, is thinking about women's rights. Whereas this follows, we can conduct, we can deduct that the notion of gender equality strategy is not a new concept. It is a historical fact established for the first time in 1789 during the French Revolution. Olympe de Gouges asked the woman to get aware about their own rights and freedoms. She says to woman, woman wake up. The toxin of reason is being heard throughout the whole universe. Discover your rights. The powerful empire of nature is no longer surrounded by prejudice, fanaticism, superstition, and lies. The flame of the truth has dispersed all the clouds of folly and usurpation. Therefore, Olympe de Gouges is calling women to take an action, basically speak about their basic rights as citizens of a peculiar society. Throughout history, actually, women fought for their own rights. However, it is, least, it is a crystally clear that men deprive women of their own rights in the course of history. It is not nature who deprived women of their own rights. Well, I spoke about women's rights because I would like to briefly mention about the female type of migration. The female migration shapes the balance of the world and testifies about the autonomy of women, their societal and individual emancipation and independence. Autonomy means independence. It looks like sovereignty. It looks like, like to some extent a woman's sovereignty and sovereignty means independence. Therefore, it is some way of getting um, a place in the society where you need to uh, dive deeply into um, basically the categories of, of rights in order to be able to make a change in the society where you live. Well, women migrate to other countries because too often labor inequalities are insurmountable obstacles in the process of personal and career development. Undoubtedly, during a job interview, women are asked some questions in a recurring fashion. Do they plan to get pregnant soon? Soon? What is their religion and ethnic background, etc.? Well, instead of women to be evaluated on the basis of their scientific expertise, too often they are discriminated. Why would an employer ask such personal questions? What will benefit him, her, or her? Absolutely nothing. Well, the scholar Pichet reiterated that there were numerous historical cases about women's labor exploitation, a topic that is more abundantly analyzed by Mirjana Morokvasic. And in her paper, Mirjana Morokvasic, um, as a scholar, examines basically um, diverse trajectories of female migrants across the world. And she's illustrating the many cases of female labor exploitation. This is a sentence um, stated by Pichet. I'm quoting him. And, she's, and he says that for Mirjana Moscovich, female migration can be a positive feature. And that this means emancipation, financial independence, and this can also sometimes reinforce gender inequalities. Um, the notion of gender inequalities basically uh, that Pichet emphasized reflects explicitly the patriarchal version of the role of the woman in the society. Women needed or were forced to take care of the children and the household. Unfortunately, women were perceived as breeding machines. And this is the literal world, a uh, literal word actually. Therefore, the marginalization of the social status of women is still nowadays one of the primary factors of gender inequalities. That is also basically the most common social dilemma.
Too often, women get lower sal salaries than men because apparently women didn't negotiate the, pound, the amount of the salary they are supposed to get. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a surge of domestic violence and increased percentage of, leg of legal demands for divorce. Such compound practices reflect the societal failure in terms of common values. Well, let's start a discussion now. Why human beings always prefer to promote the importance of human health and do not include in the same process the health of the animals and the environment and how this is connected to labor inequalities, where they're all, they're all interrelated. Why after the introduction and the promulgation of many legal and international documents, labor inequalities still exist, even in the era of COVID-19? Why migrants are always discriminated and the nationals of a peculiar country enjoy more privileges in the field of work? Well, from one side, there is the Istanbul Convention known as the Council of Europe Convention on preventing and combating violence against women and domestic violence. That was actually as a convention adopted on May 11, 2011, but entered into force in 2014. And the European Women's Lobby in their official report published in April 2020 asked the governments to implement the various mechanisms of protection for women during the COVID-19 era. Uh, the European Women Lobby says, I'm quoting them, governments must ensure that protection services and mechanisms are in place and running to support all women and girls who are victim of male violence and exploitation. Now is the same to implement more fully than ever the Council of Europe Convention on preventing and combating violence against women and domestic violence. And this is the Istanbul Convention. Well, reshaping the cultural mode of perception will always internalize the essence of human values. Migrations are like mutations and cultural, cultural mutations are the primary modifiers of the patriarchal chaos. I think that these are the two most important sentences that I need to, to reiterate in this talk, that reshaping the cultural mode of perception will, interna will internalize the essence of human values and human rights. And migrations are, are like mutations. Cultural mutations are the primary modifiers of the patriarchal chaos. chaos. So we can stop the patriarchal chaos by including woman in the process of political decision making. Well, in the era of COVID-19, there was a significant rise of poverty or the presence of economic recessions. Uh, it is important to present the definition of economic recession before proceeding with the explanation of the question of COVID-19 and the rise of poverty. A recession occurs when a constant economic decline is noticed in the annual GDP of a peculiar state. Thus, with the emergence of COVID-19 and with the closure of many factories, people unfortunately lost their jobs. And this resulted with a new phenomenon, rise of poverty. In some countries, there is an extreme rate of poverty, such as India, Africa, and the Middle East. So when there is a recession, the level of unemployment is very high. Therefore, taking into, so, in, into account the social aspect of education, well, there should not be only political allegations that will tarnish the reputation or the image of the institutional collapse, but also legal reforms that will restructure from scratch the dysfunctional mechanisms of procedural law. Well, um, I can say that uh, no one is ready to receive the gift of an institutional earthquake. There are numerous textual documents that legal specialists adopted. However, is the theoretical legal provision really normative? In some countries, yes, in others, no. The absence of legal implementation of the legislative rules in some countries will create too often a backdrop of ideologies and conspiracy theories. Pandemic, pandemics might last for a long time, but the process of recovery is even longer. Um, well, we know that formally there is a prohibition of labor inequalities because in every convention in the world that is talking about human rights, 
there is one peculiar concept that is mentioned, and that is the concept or the notion of human dignity that formally or literally prohibits the existence of labor inequalities. We all know that there is no legal definition for migration, but there is a societal definition for migration. People just move from one to another place for economic or family reasons. However, during the pandemic, people were obliged to remain in the cities where they live because many airlines canceled numerous flights all over the globe. Asylum seekers are the ones who, are, who experienced a difficult transition. about labor inequalities during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Are they considered to be a vicious cycle? So what is a vicious cycle? Actually, is the pandemic COVID-19 a vicious cycle? Well, a vicious cycle is a phenomenon marked by a significant dose of negative features. Even though you might have a long working experience, you still may face labor inequalities and vice versa. If you don't have any job experience, you still may face labor inequalities. As a result, COVID-19 as a virus forced the authorities to shut down the factories for a specific period of time. Notwithstanding, pandemics can change completely the peaceful pathway of the economic prosperity and provoke unmanageable labor inequalities. Lessons from past pandemics also suggest that the resulting higher levels of inequality could undermine social cohesion and jeopardize future growth, increasing the risks of a vicious cycle. Well, um, I can basically state that this was a sentence from uh, Jurzu Kenilia, um, Nair Madhu Medha, Pukam Natalie. Sedik Sadi Tahsin Tan Anthony Yakadina Irina, and in the paper entitled COVID 19 and Inequality in Asia Breaking the Vicious Cycle, that was published in the International Monetary Fund. It's a working paper. Well, over history, or, um, during the course of history, I mean, Louis Pasteur, who was a French public health scientist, he expressed firmly that. Gentlemen, it is the microbes who will have the last world. Louis Pasteur is famous for inventing the germ theory of disease. According to this theory, germs are the primary agents of infection. Pasteur is also famous for discovering the germs or microbes that can destroy or spoil the quality of food. He discovered that under heat, microbes die. For instance, he suggested the milk to be heated on um, 71 degrees Celsius, the milk, if it is not heated, might contain, I mean, the milk, if it's not heated, might contain microbes or bacteria that can cause tuberculosis. This process is called pasteurization. The bacteria that can be found in the milk are Listeria, Salmonella, Escherichia coli, and many others. However, COVID-19 is a virus, not a bacteria. Antimicrobial resistance is the most crucial problem of the 21st century. COVID-19, special legal policies, extraordinary measures, a final resurgence of labor inequalities. Well, setting up a legal policy endowed with extraordinary measures will definitely close the dilemma regarding the emergency health situations. For instance, like the COVID-19 one, in another word, the primary questions, question was to set up not only some sense of preparedness, but also a window of safety, economic and health safety, like it was the case in some Asian countries. A plethora of countries tried to save their economy from collapse. Turkey allowed during the summer 2020 foreign tourists to spend their summer holidays in Antalya, Kushadasi, Fethiye, and Izmir by promoting the policy of health, of healthy tourism. Even a corona type of insurance was promoted. Many measures were adopted. Tourists had to wear masks permanently, keep social distance of minimum two meters, wash hands for at least two, 20 seconds, arrive three hours in advance at the airport, et cetera, et cetera. In Turkey, the healthy tourism program was entitled as assessment form on 
COVID-19 and hygiene practices applied during pandemic for accommodation in food and beverage facilities. I find, I, or I, for, I personally think that this healthy tourism uh, policy was a successful for Turkish economy during the summer of 2020, because um, there was to some extent uh, a promotion of uh, health tourism work for the tourists or the foreigners who are working in Turkey for a specific period of time, because their resident permits were extended. And the main uh, goal was to protect the well being of the economy and to prevent the recurring co contagion of COVID 19, to avoid a second or third wave of coronavirus and implementation of confinement measures. It was very important also to establish synchronous and asynchronous communication with migrants and workers. Teleworkable activities, educational programs, and regular work meetings were the primary indicators of the effectivity of the measures undertaken to combat the COVID-19 virus. What are the lessons for the future? The primary responsibility is to protect the health of the citizens. COVID-19 is not going to be the last virus that will emerge. There are going to be other impediments in the future as well. People should respect the curfew regulations imposed by their governments. Legislators should adopt immediate extraordinary laws or legal provisions to, prefer, to preserve the proper functions of the state apparatus. If the, structure, if the structure of the state mechanism is organized adequately, the pandemics or epidemics won't ruin the economy. Hence, the best lesson for the future is to understand the crucial meaning of the notion of vigilance. Thus, there should be always some extra alternative for increasing the rate of production. For instance, the government can finance the medium-sized and small firms. If they finance the medium-small and the medium-sized and the small firms, there won't be a new resurgence, resurgence of labor of inequalities, and people will be able to um, preserve their job jobs actually because the government will finance the, the small firms and the medium-sized ones so there won't be a new rate of unemployment a sudden one for instance during a pandemic uh, the holdings and other strong companies can make donations and organize fundraising projects sometimes unfortunately fiscal policy is nothing uh, enough strong to fight against a sudden recession that may endure for a few consecutive months or even years the conclusion or the final words about this talk that I would like to give, that I would like to mention actually, is that the most valuable rest lesson regarding COVID-19 is the necessity to have some sense of preparedness and to be able to cope with the situation you're facing. Expecting the unexpected sometimes is beneficial as well. Even though such experiences are not always positive, there can be a social confrontation that might, that might exacerbate the harmony of the families. The freedom of the individual, the eagerness to change the status quo and amel ameliorate the scope of future events. This, the zoonotic origin of COVID-19 and other types of coronaviruses reflects the importance of human health as well, because germs and bacteria rapidly propagate. COVID-19 is not a bacteria, it's a virus. It's a zoonotic virus transmitted from animals to humans. Because sometimes humans are uh, reducing the, uh, basically the territorial form of the animals and they, are and they are urbanizing it and therefore they are settling there. And when they do this, the animals feel like they have less space for living and this causes them stress and they come to live nearby the cities or the urban places. And this is how rapidly also viruses can be transmitted um, to um, human beings because people are sometimes eating contaminated meat as well from the animals that were infected with coronavirus. Prevention is the best instrument for diminishing the high level of infection. In the Balkan region, the phrase prevention is better than cure is very famous. This, pro this phrase was originally coined by, by Desiderius Erasmus, a Dutch philosopher and scientist. Nevertheless, having a healthy mode of, of life is indispensable because like this, we are not only protecting ourselves, but also the animals and the environment. Humans cannot survive without nature. However, nature can survive without human beings. 
nature is definitely more powerful. However, labor inequalities existed since many centuries ago, and therefore the necessity to reduce the social pressures, pressure of migrants and diminishing the vestige of labor inequalities will definitely change the scope of many work policies. Most importantly, this will no longer create disparities among many affected regions in the world. What is the forthcoming situation of the world? No one knows, but certainly you will discover in the future. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you, Hristina, for a very enlightening talk today. Uh, for everyone who missed today's live video, please be informed that uh, this video is recorded and it will be shared on our social media website, YouTube account, and also be shared on the Social Science Lab uh, account. And of course, Ms. Hasina's personal YouTube account. Uh, thank you once again for joining us today. And uh, Ms. Hasina, thank you once again for the enlightening talk. You're welcome. It was a pleasure um, uh, um, lecturing or giving a talk today. It was a very general topic that, per, um, that perhaps many people know, but I think it is indispensable to reiterate some concepts and notions that we hear, but we do not know in depth their meaning and uh, purpose. Yes, exactly. Uh, yes. For everyone, uh, who, anyone else who has questions, uh, they can comment their questions on the Facebook account. Yes, and, yes, uh, we will answer them by uh, messaging them. them. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much for this given opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Okay, All right, everyone, I hope you have a nice day or a nice night wherever you, you are, and goodbye. Goodbye. All the best. Have a great evening.